Part 1. A Study in Forces. 10 AR to 20 AR. Chapter 1. Tocasia. The Argavian archaeologist removed her lenses and rubbed her tired eyes. The desert grit was everywhere, all the more so when the stiff breeze blew eastward from the inland waste. The desert air was warm as forest coals, but Tocasia was glad for the gentle wind. Without the breeze, it would be merely unbearable and stiffingly hot at the dig site. The aged researcher sat at an ornate table, a huge monstrosity with thick, fluted legs, and a heavy top inlaid with polished shell. It was a gift from one of the noble families of Argive, a family for straining out an errant sign of their line. The heirloom looked almost comical perched on the outcropping that Tokasia had claimed as her headquarters beneath a tarpaulin of pale gray tomoko muslin. The gift had been well-intentioned, and she could only imagine the expense incurred in sending the table out to her. The desert had already taken its toll. The hand-rubbed finish had been almost entirely blasted away by the sand-laden wind, and the wood beneath had cracked as the heat boiled away the liquid still locked within. Furniture suitable for an Argivian dressing room was much less acceptable in the desert. Still, it was a flat space, and Tokasi appreciated it. The tabletop was littered with scrolls half shoved in their cases, and survey maps weighed down by bits of rusted metal, the torn edges of the papers fluttering in the breeze. A particularly large chunk of bluish metal sat directly before Tokasia, damning her with its enigma. It looked like a parody of a human skull, with a bat-like face and cold, impassive eyes of colored crystal set in the unfamiliar blue-tinted metal. The metal itself seemed as ductile and soft as copper, but bending it only caused it to reform slowly into its original shape. A set of thran glyphs ran along the underside of the skull, which Tokasia had translated roughly as Su Chi. Whether this was the name of the creature, its owner, or its manufacturer was a mystery to her. The skull's lupine lower jaw jutted forward, ending in a handful of fangs. The top of the skull had been peeled away to reveal a tangle of blue metal cables. Set among them was a single large gemstone, the shade of old glass, worn beyond age, and marred by a longitudinal crack along its top. So Cassia sighed. Even if her diggers could find the rest of this Thran artifact's body, it was unlikely that they would ever get it working again. The damage was too extensive, and even if they could recreate its form, the gemstone that provided its power was shattered. They found only a double handful of such stones that were whole and functioning. Glowing in rainbow hues, they could power the old Thran devices. The largest of those stones were shipped away to Argot for additional study in exchange for support and supplies. A shadow touched the corner of her table, and Tokasia jumped slightly. She had been so involved with the skull that she had not seen anyone approach. She looked up into Loran's dark face and wondered how long the girl had been there. Loran was a noble daughter and one of Tokasia's best pupils, though that was not saying much given the crop of students. Early in Tokasia's career, she had accepted the financial support of many of the noble houses of Penrigan. In exchange, the houses often shipped their recalcitrant or rebellious junior members out to the desert for a summer to join the mad archaeologist in her excavation of Thran artifacts. To be honest, Tokasia thought most of the youths she received were guilty of nothing more than being typical young people, and their parents were only seeking to get them out of the manor house. Once on the site, their interest in the past varied from minimal to non-existent. They were glad to be away from the perfumed and protected courts of Penrigan, its petty intrigues, and most important, their parents. Tokasia entrusted them with as much responsibility as they accepted. Some supervised the phylogy diggers, while others helped glean and catalog the devices they brought to light. Still, others were content to man the grape-shot catapults that flanked the camp and served as a deterrent to desert raiders and the scavenging rocks. The young men and women came, served their time, and fled back to the cities with enough tales to impress their friends and enough maturity to mollify their parents. And a few such as Loran had the intelligence, the wisdom, and presence of mind to gump back after their first experience. Loran was on her third season and coming into the full flower of womanhood. Tokasia knew it was only a matter of time before the girls started to care more about ball gowns and dinner parties than for artifacts and dig sites. But for this summer at least, she was pleased to have her there to help catalog, organize, and coordinate. Tokasia blinked, pushed her spectacles up on her nose, and arched an eyebrow at the student. Loran would never speak until spoken to, though Tokasia was trying to break her of that habit. There was a pause, and then Loran said, The caravan from Argyth has arrived. Tokasia nodded. They had been watching the rising dust cloud from the east all morning, but she thought it would be late afternoon before Bly's wagons would reach them. The old wagon master must have finally sprung for new beasts, or else the old oryx had finally failed him. What Loran meant was that Bly's wagons had finally passed through the stockade gates, and Tokasi had best be there to save her students from the bad-tempered merchant's peak should the mistress of the camp not be there to greet him. Loran did not move, and Tokasia added, I will be down as soon as possible. If Bly does not like that, 
Let him stoop. Loran's lips compressed in a thin line. Then the girl nodded and vanished. Tokasia sighed again. In two or three years, Loran would be ordering merchants like Bly around effortlessly. But for now, she and most other students were cowed by the merchant's bluster. Tokasia watched Loran's retreating form clad in the cream-colored working shift that most female students labored in. She noted that the girl was already wearing her hair longer, in the fashion favored in the capital. Loran's hair was long, dark, and thick, making her exotic among most of her compatriots. A touch of the desert was the saying among the Argivian nobility. It was not a compliment, but rather a tacit accusation that some desert barbarian was lurking in the family tree. Perhaps that was why Loran kept coming back for the summers. It could not be family pressure. The last time Tokasia visited Penrigan, Loran's mother had made it quite clear that Loran should curb such foolish endeavors as rooting around in the dust for scraps of metal. Tokasia looked out over the camp, a rough wall built around a collection of hills. The low rolling hills were incised by dry washes and proved to be extremely productive of Thran artifacts. The stockade was more of a demarcation than a true protection, but it kept what desert bandits that might prove a problem at bay. The barricade of piled stones was flanked by the pair of oversized catapults loaded with loose rubble to keep the rocks away. Within the walls, most of the activity of the camp was slow in the summer heat. One particular hill, where they had recovered the Su Chi skull, proved particularly promising, and was now covered with a grid of string and stakes for further examination. The slow-footed onulates plotted to meet the wagons, steered by noble boys who enjoyed thwacking the great albino beasts with their makeshift goads. The gate had closed on the last wagon now, and a wide girth figure left from the lead carriage, waving his arms in an animated fashion. Bly seemed to enjoy terrorizing the students out here, perhaps because he had a kowtow to their parents back in Penrigan. Tokasia smiled at the thought of Bly back in the Argavian capital, hat in hand, head bowed slightly, trying to enunciate his request without resort to curses. The desert was probably the best place for him as well. The archaeologist ran her hands through her short graying hair, trying to shake out any non-existent tangles. When she had been young, her hair had been longer and almost dark and luxuriant as Laurent's. There might have been a touch of the desert in her family tree as well. Still, age tended to make all peoples equal, and her shorn locks were easier to care for in the desert. Tokasi gave the blue metal skull an affectionate pat and rose from her camp chair. She reached for a walking stick, a shattered fragment of wood and bright steel from an unknown Thran mechanism. She was still spry enough to justify the staff as a walking stick to aid her in navigating the uneven ground and not as a crutch, but aches in her joints in the cool of the early desert morning told a different tale. Tokasia took her time descending from her perch. Bly would bluster and complain, but that never stopped him from dealing. The artifacts and saleable loot he would bring back from the site was worth the long and arduous trip inland. It was no surprise then that once she reached the wagons, there was a wide circle of students and teamsters surrounding the wagon master. The surprise was the pair of young men that Bly was berating. The two were strangers. One was dark-haired and stocky and flinched every time Bly bellowed. He was half hiding behind the other, a lean, tawny-haired boy who stood bolt upright, taking the full blast of the wagon master's thunder. Frauds, cheats, liars, shouted Bly. The pair were all of ten years old, Tokasia guessed. Twelve at the outside. That was about the age nobles first considered sending their children out to Tokasia's camp. But these were not her students, and no new arrivals were expected until the beginning of the next season. Loran was at one side of the crowd, looking both embarrassed by the scene and relieved that she was not the object of Bly's temper. You seek to cheat me! Now get busy unloading, you motherless dogs, sputtered Bly, a crimson hue crawling through his face. The dark-haired boy raised his fist and took a step forward. The older blonde lad held out his arm to block his companion, but his eyes never left the wagon master. Sir, he said calmly, though loud enough for the surrounding crowd to hear. We had a bargain. We will work for you now to pay for our passage. We are now here, so we will work for you no longer. Wagon master Bly turned an apoplectic purple. You agreed to serve me as hands for the journey. The journey isn't over. We still have to get back to Penrigan. But then we'll have to get back here on our own, exploded the stockier boy, leaning forward against the other's restraining arm. What's going on here, Bly? said Tokasia. The wagon master wheeled on the scholar, blinking as if he had only just then noticed her. A private matter, Mistress Tokasia. Nothing more. The leaner of the two youths stepped forward. You are Tokasia the scholar. We're not finished, Bly started, but then Tokasia held up a hand and replied to the youth. I am, she said. I am Urza, said the youth. This is my brother Mishra. The sturdy of the two boys nodded, and the lean youth fished out a battered envelope from within his vest. The seal on the flap, the imprint of a familiar noble household, was intact. 
but it looked as if the letter had made the entire trip next to the boy's skin. Bly drew in his breath sharply at the sight. Tokasi looked at the two youths, then at the wagon master. She slid a sandblasted nail beneath the flap and popped the letter open. The script was fluid and well formed, dictated to a scribe, but the signature along the bottom was recognizable, if weak and jerky. There was silence for a moment, and she read, and both Bly and Mishra shifted impatiently, waiting for the opportunity to start the argument again. The youth Urza stood impassively, hands folded in front of him. Tokasia folded up the letter again and said thoughtfully, Well, that's that. To the two boys, she said, Get your things and follow the ran there to your quarters. To Bly, she said, These two are now my responsibility. They are joining as my students. The purple hue returned to Bly's face. But they owe me half a trip. You're telling me that I have to leave these snipes break an agreement just because of some letter? Tokasia let the wagon master complain. She watched the boys pull off slender backpacks from one wagon and lope after the slim form of Loran. Only when they had passed through the crowd and that the crowd had dispersed to tend to the immediate business of unloading the supplies did she turn her attention to Bly. The other agreement was for them to work their way through the journey, she said. When they arrived here, that journey ended. They are taking up residence here. Do you understand? There was steel in her voice, and even Bly knew she could not push the scholar around when she took this tone. Instead, he took a deep breath and forced himself to calm. So Cassia held up the letter. This is from the father, from who I have heard not for many years. What do you know of him? Bly stammered for a moment, then said, He's not well at all. Remarried recently. A virago. A real vixen from a good family with her own children. He was taken seriously ill about a month before we left Penrigan. He might be dead by this time. He might be, said Tokasia solemnly. Or he might be too ill to see his son's well-being. You didn't know about this letter, did you? The wagon master looked at his feet, embarrassed. No, you didn't, continued Tokasia. Because if you had, you wouldn't have tried to lock those children in such a hard bargain. Full trip indeed. Knowing you, you probably worked those two as hard as your aurochs, if not harder. Because you knew that without the letter, I wouldn't take them in on just their word. The new mother. She's a hellkite, said Bly softly, by way of explanation. One of them gone, but wouldn't spend a groat on their well-being. Didn't want to dip into the family monies, since they're all probably hers now. So you gave the boys a break, worked them like slaves, and tried to keep them, since no one would notice their fate, said Tokasia. That's low, even for you, Bly. Now get the supplies unloaded. And yes, I'll do a complete inventory, thank you. And then we'll load the wagons for a return. There are some items that will fetch you a goodly profit, despite your scandalous behavior. Tokasia wanted to lecture Bly a bit longer but Loran came running up. Mr. Tokasia, the new boys. Tokasia scowled at the student. The young girl had actually spoken up, so it must be important. Yes? They're in a fight, said Loran, with Richow and a couple of the other boys. Tokasia uttered a mild curse. Bly chuckled. I can always take them back if you want, scholar, he said. The scholar shot the wagon master a look that would skin an ox at 15 paces. To Loran, she said, Get to Moe and a couple of the other diggers to break it up, and bring the boys to my tent. Loran hesitated, and Tokasia practically stamped her foot. Now! The young girl disappeared in a puff of dust, and Bly said, I think that pair are more trouble than they are worth, if you don't mind me saying. I wouldn't be surprised, grunted the scholar. Their father was always a handful. So you're going to keep them? asked the wagon master, shaking his head. Tokasia sighed. I, I owe their father that much, for an old favor. Must be some favor, said Bly. What did he give you? Only my freedom, said Tokasia, and turned away from the wagon master without waiting for a reply. Bly looked at Tokasia's back as she walked back up the hill. Was it his imagination, or did she seem to be older or more fragile than she had been a few moments ago? Then she heard her hoarse shouts among the wagons, and the thought was driven from his head. You lot! He bellowed at the Teamsters, throwing himself back into the work. Have you not hauled freight before? That stuff's delicate. Handle it like you were your sister's newborn, or we don't get paid. The hill seemed steeper to Tokasia on the way up than it had on the way down, and the boys were already waiting for her when she reached the top. Amal and Loran were there as well. The leader of the desert tribe diggers nodded sharply at Tokasia. In Falaji, the desert tongue, he said, Watch the little one. 
He was all fist and bites when we pulled him off. So much fire in one so small. The big one bloodied Richlop's nose, but nothing broken. Tokasio responded in the same language. Richlop deserved to have his nose bloodied. Tell him he's on kitchen duty for the rest of the month. And move the boy's gear to Havoc's barracks instead. Amal nodded and left the tarp. Loran made no move to leave until Tokasia instructed her to keep an eye on Bly. The archaeologist strode around her table, sighing the walking cane back into its holder. A drum-shaped basket made from an onulet's foot. She leaned on her palms on the desk and looked at the two boys. Their fine vests had been shredded in the battle, and Urza's pockets had been torn out in the fight. Misha had acquired a black eye, and both boys showed numerous scratch marks. Tokasia sighed and lowered herself into her seat. The boys shifted uncomfortably. Fifteen minutes, she said. Fifteen minutes and you're already in the fight. A new record even for this place. Both boys started talking.